In today's tutorial, we're going to be covering the process of molding and casting an antique cast iron utility cover. This is from Dallas's own trolley, the McKinney Avenue Transit Authority. You can check them out on Instagram. I'll put the link down there. So be sure to check them out. They are, it's a, quite a, an amazing thing they have downtown. This is a fully restored streetcar. This is the oldest operating streetcar, I believe, in North America. So uh, anyway, without further ado, we're going to be making a mold of this cast iron piece and discussing all of the little details that go along with that. We're going to be making our silicone mold. And then from that silicone mold, we are going to produce a hard resin positive. So this, of course, is the jumping off point for any kind of production casting. So McKinney Avenue uh, Transit Authority was kind enough to uh, let us play with a little bit of history here. So we're going to take you through the process of making a mold and a test pull of this part. Now, the first step in making a mold of our utility plate here, this is a cast iron piece. So uh, real important with a part like this, even though cast iron doesn't have any adverse effects with uh, platinum silicone, because this has been kind of out in the wild, so to speak, we don't know what all has come in contact with this. And we may not have the time for a part like this to, to run tests on it. So in this kind of situation, I typically opt for a tin cure silicone. So we are going to be using the medium catalyst with the 5092. And again, the whole reason for that is this is going to be for resin casting. So we're not worried about tin cure not being compatible with the casting material, anything like that. But that thought process is really important to remember. You want to make sure that your mold material is compatible with your pattern, but you want to make sure that everything in that entire workflow is compatible. So think about your casting material and work back from that point. So for instance, in this case, we're going to be casting some of the art cast resin into the finished mold. So we want to make sure that everything is compatible right back to the original pattern. And again, it's kind of a backward thinking that you engage in, starting with the, with the casting resin and making sure everything that you're using all falls in line with that and that you're not going to run into any, any compatibility issues, especially not with the silicone up against the pattern surface. So again, tin cure silicone, the 5092 we're using for this, just to make sure that we don't run into any compatibility issues up against this cast iron pattern. Now, as is custom here at Biddy Mold Supply, a, a simple part like this, it's basically a, a, a relief piece, this medallion or plate cover or whatever, this is ideal for a one-sided, one-piece mold because obviously we don't need any detail from this side, so we're going to make a simple poured block mold. And just quick housekeeping tips on this. Foam core works great because it's easy to just score and break and put that into a radius. We could build a block, uh, you know, a block mold, a square shaped mold, but that's going to give us a lot of wasted silicone in those corners. Um, we could also get some sheet metal and uh, cut that out in a strip and stick that down with hot glue or clay. So there's a lot of ways you can tackle this, but again, Main thing you want to be aware of is compatibility. You want to make sure you're not using something as a mold box that's not compatible with your silicone. Now, one of the other little bits of uh, prep work we're going to do on this is we're going to put a bead of clay all around the perimeter of the part. And to do that, we're going to be using some of the Protolina clay. This is uh, Protolina Soft. It comes in these flat bars like this. And this is an inexpensive clay formula that's very soft and ideal for this kind of pattern work. So real easy to just roll it out into these little snake shapes and then press that into that gap around the part. And we're also going to fill these two holes here where this was bolted down. Not completely because we still want to get that in the final cast, but we want to fill these so that the silicone doesn't go down into that hole and then spread out under the part because there's going to be a little bit of a gap underneath. So again, we've just got our little snake of uh, oil-based clay there. And you don't have to use Protolina, but Protolina is ideal just because, for one thing, it's cheap. It's probably the cheapest clay out there for this kind of thing. But then also, this is sulfur-free. It doesn't have anything in it that's going to inhibit the silicone or uh, play havoc on your mold process. And it's just it's very easy to work with and reuse. And that softness is really helpful 
to uh, working into areas like this. Now it doesn't really read on camera, so I'll just tell you what I did here is I, I just took a little ball of clay and poked it down here with the handle of this dental tool and pushed that down and then used this end of the dental tool to uh, scrape that off flush. But that way that, that I still get the holes, so the silicone will still capture the detail of these two uh, little uh, screw holes, but I don't have to worry about that silicone going underneath my pattern because, because it is a little uneven on the back, there is a chance that it could flow underneath. And not a big deal, but that is one of those things that doesn't make for a very pretty mold. And also that would release air bubbles up into the surface of the mold. So little things like that you wanna be aware of. Now I'm gonna use the spatula to go around the edge and just clean up that excess clay. Okay, we're now ready to secure our dams around the part. And we're, again, this is just some strips of foam core board that I've scored so I can break that, bend this into a radius. And real important about your clearance on your part. I'm shooting here for about uh, three quarters of an inch, maybe half inch at the absolute minimum. But real important to remember that the softness of the silicone that you're using for a part like this will play into how thick or how thin you can get away with. We're gonna be using a Shore A25 silicone for this. So that half inch margin will be fine. But just remember, the deeper that goes and the softer the silicone, uh, the bigger the wall thickness you have to have. Because a, if we make a really deep cylindrical mold and we make that too thin, we're gonna wind up with that getting all wonky as it fills up and that hydraulic pressure starts to bow out the sides of the mold. So just an important consideration there. And again, with our foam core, one of the reasons I love this so much is I can easily glue this down with my hot glue gun. Now, one little word about hot glue guns. Every now and then you'll encounter some hot glue sticks that do inhibit platinum silicone. I've only recently run into that, but something to be aware of, it does happen. So when in doubt, run a, a test on that. Um, hard to tell in the package what's gonna do what. So uh, that's another reason why, even though I'm not using platinum silicone here, I seal it on the outside of the box, mainly because it makes for a prettier mold, but also, uh, then that doesn't put my platinum that's going to be in the mold in direct contact with the hot glue. But occasionally that happens. Uh, I don't know if it's just these particular hot glue sticks or what, but again, tin cure silicone being used here, so not going to be a problem. Now, last but not least, once we have our, our pattern secured, our mold box built, and we've checked all the the surrounding uh, base to make sure there's no gaps in the seam. And that's another one, one of the reasons I keep my hot glue gun uh, handy when I start pouring silicone because if for some reason you do have a leak, it's pretty easy to stop that real quick with a hot glue gun. Now for our release, we're gonna be using the Super Release PTR. And just remember, anytime you're releasing a pattern like this, this is cast iron, so we wanna make sure this is released really well but we also want to give it time to dry. So as soon as we apply our release, we're going to give it about 20 or 30 minutes to completely outgas before we mix and pour our silicone. Now, one other little detail, you can see a few of the little spots of release there is to go in with a soft disposable brush and just work that release around and push that into any of those deep areas because Cast iron, because uh, a lot of metals contain silica, which really want to stick sometimes to silicone. Not all the time, but just enough that can really cause some havoc in your world. So make sure you get your pattern well released. Anytime you're dealing with a metal surface like this, be very careful to properly release it so the silicone does not stick and make a, an expensive paperweight ready to calculate our volume. Now we have a, a pretty good, pretty symmetrical circle. So we're going to do volume, a volume formula for a low cylinder. So we're going to take about, this is right under, uh, this is about 11.75. So we're going to go ahead and round up to 12, 12 inches across. And we're only going to need this to be about an inch deep. So 
since we have, let's say, 12 divided by 2 gives us our radius. So we have 6 is our radius, so radius squared, so 6 times 6 times 3.14 and then times 1 is 113 cubic inches. Now, remember that the density of your silicone will determine how much you divide this by. So the one we're using right now, I believe is about a 24, 24 cubic inches per pound. So let's take that, divide that by 24. And that's gonna be, we'll go and round up to five pounds of liquid silicone that we need to pour our mold. Okay, now we are, since we are working with a, a tin cure silicone, tin cure silicones, you definitely wanna wear gloves and you want to make sure you're working in a well-ventilated area. And we're also going to be breaking this batch down into two mixing buckets. And the reason for that is some of you out there that might have smaller size vacuum chambers, this is a handy way to go. Obviously, we can mix this in one large bucket, but uh, sometimes some of you that might have a limited capacity scale, you can break that down into two batches, and that makes things a little bit uh, more manageable. Now remember our 5092 is a 10 to 1 mix ratio. So uh, if we have say 100 grams of part B, then we're going to have 10 grams of part A. And that is by weight. Real important to remember, there's not a way to, because these are different specific gravities, if you do this by volume, you're going to wind up using way too much catalyst. I'm going to go ahead and measure out my base rubber first, and then we're going to come back and add our catalyst. And one thing about tin cure silicones, the way the tin catalyst works, it's a little bit more forgiving than a platinum catalyst. Now, it doesn't mean you can be sloppy with it, but if you were to under catalyze or over catalyze a little bit, what happens is your silicone, if it's over catalyzed, it goes faster, under catalyzed, it goes slower. Now, obviously, this point, if you don't have enough catalyst to create a reaction, then you're just going to have a bunch of goo. But the good news is uh, I've had batches that I under catalyzed by accident. It just took a lot longer for it to set up. Now, remember with your catalyst, the, the uh, 5092 is available with uh, different catalysts. This is the medium catalyst. So this allows for about a 20 to 30 minute working time, depending on your work environment. If you're in a really humid area, remember humidity accelerates tin cure silicone. So if you're down in Houston, Texas or New Orleans, you are probably not going to have that working time. So remember that even if it's a little bit cooler, the high humidity that will speed things up. Now also you want to make sure you're shaking your catalyst before you use it. This will settle out. It has a die so it's easy to spot, but also for that catalyst to be properly dispersed in there, you make sure you shake it up before each use. Now, for those of you who want to see the degassing process, you're in luck. I brought my vacuum chamber right up here in my filming area just so you can see it. So this is my happy little vacuum chamber. So again, we're going to subject both of these to a vacuum here as soon as we get these mixed up. And you always want to make sure you have enough room in the mixing bucket to allow for that expansion. When you subject this to a vacuum, that's going to rise and then collapse. And you want to make sure you have enough room for that to all take place. Okay, now that we've vacuum degassed our silicone, we're ready to pour, and we're just going to pour this in one spot and let this flow over our model. Now, one little trick that you can do, and I'll, I'll have to make a video about this uh, at a later time, is to use a little bit of silicone fluid to lower the viscosity, which softens it, and that can get you around using a vacuum chamber for some materials. 
So something to file away. Also, if you don't have a vacuum chamber back in the old days when that was not as readily available, a lot of us would just brush a thin layer or a couple of layers of silicone onto our pattern first and then pour behind that. And that way you didn't have any, uh, any bubbles right up against the surface. Now, you couldn't do pressure casting with that, but it still worked. Okay, now we're gonna go ahead and let this sit and the bubbles here that you see here are gonna rise and break. And we wanna make sure this is on a level surface and we let this sit undisturbed for the cure time. So this with the medium catalyst, we have uh, in this weather probably about a six hour demold time. But just remember the ambient humidity will play a big part in how fast or how slow that is. Okay, so this is about uh, four hours later, a little early, but because it is fairly warm, it's Texas summer, and it is a little more humid than usual in my shop. So this has set up enough, we're ready to go ahead and demold it. And just remember, if you want this to go faster, you can always use the red catalyst, or you could mix the two catalysts together if you wanna make it uh, you know, something in between. So there we go. There is our finished mold. We have a nice bubble-free mold. And you see we pulled up a little bit of, the, uh, of that iron because again, a cast iron part, it's gonna have, especially this had a little bit of rust. So what we've done is it's pulled up a little bit of the rust right there on the surface of the iron. So there's our original part and our mold, which is now ready for casting. Now as customary with a, a freshly finished mold like this, we're gonna pour a cast. And this time around, I'm just gonna try just right out of the gate. I'm gonna try to mimic the look intrinsically or internally color the resin to look as much as I can, can get it to look like that uh, cast iron piece. So to do that, we're going to use some of the Art Cast Pourable. This is our just kind of plain vanilla, uh, three minute working time casting resin, one to one mix ratio, very simple formula, but it's perfect for this kind of part. And this is a pretty economical formula too. So it just normally cures a uh, kind of a, a bone white or off white. But uh, here we're going to add some of the lava red polypig and some of the polypig brown. So and the bottles are a little confusing because I'm going to use just a little bit of the, of the red um, and a fair amount of the browns. So we want a dark brown with a little bit of a red to kind of push it over into that rust kind of look. Now, Artcast Pourable is one-to-one -one mix ratio by weight. If you mix it by volume, you're going to wind up using more, uh, more part A than part B, which is not terrible, but uh, it does you wind up getting more of a marbled kind of look in your final cast. So if that's happening, that's usually because you're off ratio in favor of part A. Now, too much part B on the other hand, that's what you always want to avoid because too much part B will give you a resin that exudes oil and is difficult if not impossible to paint. Now, normally I'd go ahead and pigment the, um, the B side first, but because this is a pretty, pretty easy color, I'm just gonna go ahead and just go for it. So again, we're gonna add probably a couple of grams or so of the, of the polypig brown to get our brown base, and then just a little bit of the red. And I'm gonna go ahead and add just a little bit more brown. Now the benefit to doing this, to this internal coloration like this, is even if you're gonna be painting a part later on, this gives you a nice internal color. So if something gets scratched or nicked or something, or when you're sanding the part, that uh, you don't have bright white plastic showing through. So. Uh, Parts that are internally colored like this just age a lot more gracefully than uh, parts that are only painted. Okay, 
So it took less resin than I expected. And one of the nice things about that is, you know, when we take this out, since the weight of this does not change, we can take our part out, weigh it, divide it by two, and we know exactly how much resin to mix up for our next batch. And another, another bitty custom, we've got a little uh, nut mold sitting over here. I'm gonna pour some in that. By now, this is old news for most of you, but you'll notice when the resin cures, it turns opaque. So it's gonna add that bone white color to whatever colors we added. So you see here, it's starting to opaque and get a little lighter. And that's gonna give us a very nice base color upon which to paint our, uh, our final look. Now, one last little side note on the casting process for this. If we wanted to get exactly the same color as our original uh, utility cover, we could always uh, use the ArtCast translucent that doesn't undergo that color change. And that allows us to get whatever color we mix up is exactly what we're gonna wind up okay, with. It's about 10 minutes later. This cured again extra fast because even though we're in an air conditioned shop, still in the high 70s so that speeds things up a little bit but we're going to use this mold this little test mold as a gauge of what's happening inside this mold so this like i said this is a little uh, bolt that i have or a nut little test mold that we've got and that's always a good way to see whatever is happening in here and use up extra resin So there we have the process of making a production mold for our out of 5092 silicone that can be used to produce dozens of casts, high quality, accurate casts in resin. Now, important note, I don't want to, I know I've already touched on this, but just to reiterate, when we're casting resin pieces that we're going to be finishing uh, with any kind of paint, remember that if you use mold release, we don't have to use a mold release with a mold like this. But if you use mold release, make sure you're using a silicone free mold release that you know you can degrease off of the part because anything that you use to help keep this resin from sticking uh, is also going to keep paint from sticking. So be very careful about that. So in this case, we're just going to go straight to the painting stage with this. Uh, we can hit this with some Rust-Oleum primer and use some of the Iron B metal coating and we get a really realistic rust finish on this if we are so inclined. But uh, that said, I hope this answered a lot of your questions. Those of you who uh, come into our physical store in uh, Richardson, Texas, uh, we have a lot of questions where people ask, uh, a lot of you have asked about uh, tin cure versus platinum, which, which is better. And it's not an issue of which is better, it's which is appropriate for the mold application. So remember that the whole point in this instance of using a tin cure silicone was so that we could mold that original uh, utility plate without danger of cure inhibition. So if you're concerned about that, that's why for a lot of restoration work, the tin cure silicone is a little safer choice for some applications. So, and also one final note, I'd like to give a big shout out and big thanks to the McKinney Avenue Transit Authority that, uh, approached us about this particular uh, utility plate and I thought this would make a cool mold. So big thanks to them for letting us uh, help with a little piece of Dallas history. Uh, I think this is the oldest operating uh, streetcar in the country, possibly. I'm not 100% not sure on that. Uh, that said, thanks again for watching and as always, the, uh, all of the products used in our videos are available on our website. So be sure to check the video description for all of the products we used. And those of you who are new to this process, I'm gonna put some links to our, uh, our mold making library, our video library page. We have a lot of resources in there for those of you just getting started. And especially, I'm gonna put a link to the uh, block mold page that goes into a lot more block mold scenarios for those of you curious about such things. So thanks again for watching. And as is customary, make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And of course, click the little bell icon so you get notified when we put out new content. And thanks for watching.